On January 30 of 2008, at around 7 a.m. in Raleigh, North Carolina, a man driving down Interstate 540 drove past something that he thought looked rather odd against the backdrop of yellowing foliage. He pulls over and backs up to get a better look. And just under the green college sign was the body of a black female, arms and legs splayed out, completely covered in blood, and undeniably deceased. When the woman's body is autopsied, you won't believe what they find inside her that throws a strange twist into this story. This is an intricate tale of family, love, passion as well as betrayal. Mix in some obsession and you have a beautiful young girl that paid an incredibly disproportionate price for an indiscretion. A mistake. My name is Killian and welcome to True Crime Stories. Sherman Jones and Cynthia Wheeler had a full house of three boys, but that would change on May 28th of 1986 when they gave birth to a healthy baby girl they named Latrice. Sherman now had a daughter and to his surprise, he also got a little best friend because she could have been the poster child of a daddy's girl, liking everything daddy liked, wanting to do everything daddy did. Sherman basically had a pint sized shadow following him everywhere and he loved every second of it and as much as he vowed to treat and love all his children the same you can say that Latrice got away with just a little bit more but no one minded everyone adored Latrice because she was the baby of the bunch but of course Sherman had to accept that as she got older she wouldn't want to always watch basketball with him anymore or follow him around asking him a million questions, that she would eventually find her own hobbies and would rather hang out with people her own age. And as she entered her teen years, that was the case. She was smart and beautiful. So with that, the boys became public enemy number one, as far as Sherman was concerned, but he stayed in his lane because he trusted her to make the right decisions. And she did. She always put education first before the boys and got herself into a good local college for accounting. And when the day came that Sherman had to drop off a trees at her college dorm, they both realized that this would be the first time that they would actually be apart. Big Sherman Jones, his only kryptonite was his baby girl. So when he hugged her goodbye, he started crying which made Latrice cry as they said goodbye. In Latrice's very first semester of college, she became friends with another accounting major named Darren Curtis. It started off innocent enough, but there was something in the air and it led to a connection that was undeniable. So much so that not long after dating, Latrice was already setting up a dinner with her parents to meet him. It's always nerve wracking to meet your girlfriend's parents for the first time. But Latrice also had three older brothers anxious to size him up. But fortunately, when the night came, he got along with them perfectly fine. As for Latrice's mom, all she needed to sense was that Darren was a good man to her daughter and she was pleased with what she saw. But that was the easy part because here comes Sherman. Latrice told Darren that her father was a retired corrections officer, which meant that he was no nonsense and commanded respect. Of course, this made Darren extremely nervous to meet him. And it surely didn't help Darren's nerves, as Sherman also dressed like a hitman. Sherman Jones went into the meeting with extreme skepticism, as any loving father would when it concerned his little girl. But off the bat, there was a good vibe about this boy to him. He learned that Darren was a former National Guard soldier and the level of respect and maturity he displayed eventually won Sherman over as well. Latrice beamed. She could not be happier with how the first meeting went. 
As the relationship progressed, they took it to the next step by moving into an apartment together, high off of love and with the future looking bright. Darren decided to even take it a step further. He proposed to Latrice and she said yes. On April 27 of 2007, they were married at the chapel in Wake County. The only problem was, Latrice's family found out after the fact. The newlyweds didn't tell anybody, so you could imagine how shocked and disappointed they were, and you could definitely imagine how furious Sherman was. He was devastated that his own daughter didn't feel the need to share something that important with the family, and he also felt completely disrespected by Darren, who didn't bother asking him for his daughter's hand in marriage, which to a man like Sherman was the only honorable thing to do. His perception of Latrice and Darren's unity had changed for the worst. It created a rift in their relationship that tore at Sherman every single day. When Latrice would call, if Sherman wasn't reprimanding her for that hasty decision, he really didn't have anything to say to her at all. The once inseparable father and daughter duo had effectively broken each other's hearts. So as the months wore on, like most young love that is quick to tie the knot, once the honeymoon phase was over, the cracks started to show. Darren's daily commutes to school and work took most of the day away and Latrice was starting to spend more and more time catching up with her studies. When they did spend time together, they didn't appear all that happy. At least that's what neighbors would later tell the police. The night of January 29, 2008, Latrice called Darren around 10 p.m., told him that it would be another late night of studying and to expect her home around midnight. Darren wasn't happy about these late night study sessions that were happening more frequently. But what could he do? Tell her not to study hard? So according to Darren, he gets home at around 8.30 p.m. from school, eats, showers, and by 11 p.m., he falls asleep while waiting for Latrice. Sadly, this was the night that she never comes home. Her body would be found the following morning under the college sign. She had been stabbed roughly 40 times in the chest, neck, and head, nearly to the point of decapitation. Detectives came on the scene, and just by the sheer overkill of the murder, they knew it had to be a crime of passion. Now they just had to identify who she was. They were notified that there was a white car seemingly abandoned about a half mile down the freeway. If it was her car, maybe it could help identify her. As they approached the vehicle, they saw that a man was already leaning into it from the driver's side door. When the man noticed the detectives heading his way, he quickly got out and started heading towards them. Now would it surprise you if you learned that the man poking around Latrice's car was none other than her husband, Darren Curtis? Well, that's who it was, and that's incredibly suspicious to detectives. Darren explained that he spotted the car from the freeway, and it looked like his wife's car, so he stopped to make sure. He showed detectives a picture of Latrice that he found in the back seat, so it was definitely her car. Darren was taken to identify the body, even though she had lost so much blood that her face now had a pale bluish tint. Darren knew that it was Latrice and mournfully told detectives that it was his wife. Now police had a name to the body and needed to get this husband down to the station immediately for questioning. This is Darren's recap of his morning. He wakes up at around 6.30 a.m. and sees that Latrice was not in bed, so he calls her phone, gets the voicemail. the voicemail. He up. doesn't like leaving voicemails, so he hangs up. He starts getting ready for work and leaves his apartment at 7.30 a.m. for his daily commute on the I-540. Traffic seemed a lot slower this morning, and as he neared where the rubberneckers were looking, he noticed that on the opposite side of the freeway, there was police tape, police cars, emergency vehicles, and something covered in a blue tarp. It looked like somebody died, but that's none of his business and he keeps driving. 
Then he saw a white car, maybe half a mile down, that sure looked like Latrice's. This triggered an uneasy feeling in him, realizing that he still hadn't heard from his wife. He takes the next exit and turns back towards home. Once there, he looked around the apartment, and it really did seem that his wife never came home. He calls up Latrice's father, Sherman, to see if he knew where she was, but he got an icy response back. How would I know where she is? She's your wife. Not knowing what else to do, Darren then calls the police and reports Latrice missing. Darren gets back on the highway and soon would be pulling over behind that white car. At this point, he says that he was pretty sure that this was Latrice's white Nissan Sentra. He opens the driver's door and looked inside, where to his horror, saw the interior in complete disarray. The center console was broken and there was blood stains all over the door. Reality truly sunk in when he noticed their Christmas photos in the back seat. Detectives were naturally skeptical of the husband's story because it seemed a bit unlikely that he just happened upon his wife's car before they did. It seemed more plausible that he was just making sure he didn't leave something incriminating behind. Plus, how could any loving husband not realize his wife never came home? Then to wake up, still alone, still not worried enough to even leave a voicemail. Darren explained to them that he did talk to his wife the night before and she told him that she would be home late. It was an exhausting day for him so he fell asleep waiting for her and it wasn't out of the ordinary for Latrice to leave the house before he was even awake because they were both very busy people juggling work and school. Detectives tell him that it's just too coincidental that he reports his wife missing at pretty much the same time the body was being discovered. It sounded more like scrambling to create a narrative. Darren tells him that it was coincidental. He and his wife had a great marriage. He loved her and he has no reason to kill her. That same morning, after hanging up with his good-for-nothing son-in-law who seems to have misplaced his daughter, Sherman turns his attention back to the morning news and across the screen it read, Body found on I-540. What Sherman did to Latrice now seemed justified because look at the man she picked. He didn't even notice she was gone. Later that day, Sherman and his wife Cynthia would be called into the sheriff's office where they would be given the news that their daughter Latrice was murdered. Sherman also learns that Darren was the one that identified the body. Sherman now hated that man. He didn't even think to inform the parents of his dead wife. The disrespect was more than he could bear. Detectives were surprised when they heard from Darren again so soon. He tells them that he obtained Latrice's phone logs because he wanted to get in contact with the people that she talked to most to see if they knew anything. But a strange number caught his eye because it was a phone number she dialed right after talking to him that night. He also discovered that his wife had texted this number a lot. He called it and a man picked up. He asked the man who he was and how he knows Latrice. The man's response was to ignore all of Darren's questions and instead ask, Is she okay? Let me know if she's okay. Darren was in a state of shock because it looks like his wife had another man in her life. The detectives took down the information with a high level of doubt, just another suspect trying to muddy the waters, but they logged it in nonetheless and acquired their own copy of the phone records. There's no way that the medical examiner of Latrice Curtis was expecting to retrieve from her body an entire condom which was lodged deep within her vagina. DNA tests were immediately sent out as well as a call to Darren. He was asked if he was intimate with his wife that night and if the condom was his, in which he simply tells detectives that he didn't use a condom with his wife. 
Detectives know that Darren is a college-educated man. He wouldn't be dumb enough to lie about something like that, right? Latrice Curtis knew that this was a mistake while it was happening, that this was not how she was raised, not who she is or wanted to be, but she still made the mistake. There was a classmate of hers named Stephen Randolph. He was tall, athletic, handsome, and he said the right things that made her feel some type of way. She did make sure to tell him that she was married, but that did little to curb Stephen's charm and her attraction to him. So on the night Latrice made that call to Darren about studying late at the library, Latrice instead found herself in Stephen's bedroom. One thing led to another and Latrice had broken her marital vows. Afterwards, she got dressed, got her stuff, bid Stephen good night and left. What she didn't know was that Stephen Randolph also got dressed and headed out right after her. Stephen Randolph was built for athletics and he would excel at it. He was serious about the game of basketball in which he played for the college team and he was serious about making it to the NBA and his commitment showed, but he was also really serious about the ladies. He was playing the balancing act with Latrice because he already had a girlfriend and lord knows how many other side pieces. When it came to women, it was easy for Steven, but when it came to money, he was dead broke. Working part time at a local car wash while juggling school, basketball and girls was not easy. He hit a really rough patch in his life and wound up homeless, crashing on friends couches and sleeping in cars. And then a well-known local minister named Robert Reeves became his saving grace. Pastor Reeves, who got his car washed at Stephen's work, had struck up a friendship with him. Eventually, Stephen felt comfortable enough to confide in the pastor about his money troubles, current living situation, and his dream of making the NBA. The pastor believed Stephen to be a good, hard-working kid that just needed a break, so he offered a basement room in his house for $300 a month if Stephen could manage that. To Stephen, it was a chance to get back on his feet, not worrying about where to sleep at night should have a positive effect on his schooling and basketball. They shook on it, and Stephen moved in. This would be the room where he was with Latrice. So let's go back to that night, when they finished having sex. When Stephen pulled out, the condom was missing. He started looking around for it, on the bed, on the floor, but it was nowhere to be seen. They both were horrified when they realized it could only be in one place. The reality of a pregnancy was now in the cards. Stephen starts to freak out. His ambitions and dreams might all boil down to this one mistake. Latrice tries to get the condom out, but couldn't. Stephen lent a helping hand, but was unsuccessful as well. There was nothing they could do, but just hope that the condom will come out on his own. But mainly, that Latrice doesn't get pregnant. The new story of Latrice Curtis being found murdered on the highway was the top story everywhere. Stephen Randolph after two days of soul searching and getting advice from Pastor Reeves, walked into the police station with the pastor at his side in support and asked to talk to detectives. Detectives thought it was quite interesting to bring a man of God along to vouch for or alibi him, no doubt. But nonetheless, it was only a matter of time anyways because they already heard the name Stephen cute NCCU basketball player from Latrice's close friends already. Detectives knew Pastor Robert Reeves, who was a pillar in the community and that his words held weight, so they took the opportunity to ask him about Stephen Randolph. Pastor Reeves told the story of how they met, thought he was a good kid, and that he had been living in his basement for quite some time now. Detectives asked if he knew that Stephen was bringing girls into his house. Pastor Reeve said that he did know and that Stephen was quite the ladies man. And even though he really didn't like it, all he could do was express his dismay 
but overall, Stephen was allowed to do as he pleased. And as far as that night goes, he remembers seeing a white car parked in front of his house after returning home from church. He knew it belonged to Latrice because he had met her once before and that she was a lovely girl. He didn't know when Latrice left, but he did happen to see Stephen leave the house that night. Stephen Randolph said that he met Latrice at school and there was an attraction from the start on both sides. Latrice did tell him that she was married, but also added that the marriage was in trouble. He said he didn't pursue anything more from her than just being friends, though they started to hang out more and more often. As for the night in question, Stephen said it was the first time they had sex, then the condom debacle, and after that, she left. He washed up, got dressed, and went to Velma's house, his girlfriend that Latrice knew nothing about. Stephen said that he got into his car and along the way called his friend Warren and told him about the condom situation and how worried he was that he might get Latrice pregnant. Warren tries to calm him down and meets him at Velma's house to continue the conversation whenever they got the chance. They all hung out until 1 a.m. and Stephen says that he gets home around 1.30 a.m. Detectives get a hold of Stephen's friend Warren and asked him to recount his night. Warren says that Stephen called him that night in a panic. He decides to do his friend a favor and be there for him. He meets up at Velma's house to hang out, but Stephen's phone kept ringing and it was Latrice. Your phone blowing up from another girl while you're at your girlfriend's house was not a good look. Warren said that when Stephen found the right moment to pick up, he was able to hear the conversation. Latrice wanted to take their relationship to the next level and that she was ready to leave her husband for him. Stephen shuts the conversation down and they hang up. Warren says they continue to hang at Velma's house until 1 a.m. Detectives then got a hold of Stephen's girlfriend, Velma, and asked her if he was with her that night. Of course, they had to fill her in that her boyfriend was intimate with their murder victim just prior to arriving at her house. As devastated as Velma was, she doesn't believe that Stephen would be capable of killing anyone, and he couldn't have done it because he was with her the whole time until 1 a.m., but then she offered some troubling bit of information that Stephen and herself had been getting threatening phone calls from a man with a blocked number. The caller wanted Stephen to stop doing what he's doing or he'll break his legs and end his NBA dreams. One day, as Stephen was walking to his car, he found all four of his tires slashed, short on money already. This was another terrible setback. Shortly after that, Velma received a call taunting her that her car was just vandalized. When she races to check, all her tires were fucked as well. Detectives mulled over the alibis, and at least at face value, Stephen's story seemed to be checking out. Also, there didn't seem to be much motive for Stephen to even kill Latrice. The condom incident just happened, so why murder so hastily over a pregnancy that might not even exist? But there was one realization that did interest the detectives. The fact that Latrice was having an affair at all directed their attention right back to Darren. Because according to Darren, they were in a loving marriage. But from what they heard from neighbors, they didn't look like a happy couple. And now they learn his wife didn't think so either, ready to leave him for another man. Finding him at his dead wife's car that morning seemed even less coincidental now. He did admit to knowing Stephen's number and those threatening phone calls for Stephen to stop. Stop what? Most likely to stop seeing Latrice. And who would want that more than a husband who just learned his wife was cheating on him? Sherman Jones told anyone that would listen that he knew his son-in-law killed his baby girl. Detectives agreed. They obtained search warrants for Darren's house and vehicle, as well as Stephen's car and the basement he was living in. Both men complied with everything the detectives wanted, 
all the way down to DNA. But then, another twist was thrown into the case as the search of Darren Curtis came away clean as a whistle. But the same could not be said of Stevens. As they were searching Pastor Reeves' property, a minivan was parked in the driveway and the plates came back as belonging to the pastor as to be expected. But something truly alarming came back as well. This minivan was sighted as an abandoned vehicle at 1.30 a.m. by a trooper the night Latrice was murdered. Detectives get in touch with the trooper that made the citation and what he told them shocked everyone. The trooper noticed the minivan on the shoulder of I-540 with its hazard lights on so he stopped to check. He noticed the windows were down even though it was raining, keys still in the ignition but found no one inside or around the vehicle. He ran the plates and it was clean. He also said he saw another white vehicle with its hazards on, but before he could get to that, he was called away to a more pressing matter. Detectives pinpointed the location of where the minivan and the white car were, and it was right where Latrice's body was found. So imagine this, if the trooper was able to investigate that white vehicle that night, he might have stumbled upon the body of Latrice Curtis. What's more unnerving to think about, he might have also come across a killer hiding in the darkness. It's speculated that once the trooper left the scene, the killer moved Latrice's car a half mile down the road to delay the discovery of her body. Detectives paid Pastor Reeves another visit to question him about his minivan. After learning where his van was spotted, a look of concern crossed his face, as if a realization had come upon him. He gathers himself and tells detectives that since Stephen's car was vandalized, he had given him a spare key so that he could use it anytime he needed it. Stephen must have taken it out that night. The pastor was apologetic that he didn't have any more information because when he came home from church that night, he went to bed early. Detectives now were able to paint a better picture of what happened that night. Once the lab came back with DNA tests, they felt they had enough information to formally make a charge. And on February 2nd of 2008, they arrested Pastor Robert Reeves. What detectives had held close to the vest was that upon their first meeting at the station, they noticed that the pastor had what appeared to be fresh wounds on one of his arm, which he explained away as an injury from helping Stephen move a table. He made it seem trivial, but detectives followed up. Reeves' own sister, Willie May, remembered her brother helping Stephen move that desk, but was sure he didn't sustain any injuries. They do a background check on the good pastor, and what they found was shocking. A long criminal history of sexual offenses. One egregious charge was sexual misconduct with a minor at his previous church in South Carolina. Numerous charges, similar in nature, one after the other, stretching as far away as New York. Robert Reeves was bold enough to simply move from a place he defiled to the very next town, start a new church, and do it all over again. Another vital detail was Stephen describing how Reeves' alarm system worked. The pastor had given him a code when he first moved in, which deactivates the alarm before entering the house. It was a personal code only for Stephen, and the pastor used the master code. Detectives checked the alarm records and saw that Stephen's code disarmed the alarm at around 1.30 a.m. But at 2.30 a.m., someone disarmed it again with the master code. Detectives went on to subpoena the pastor's phone records and learned that Reeves had three separate phones and the third phone's logs lined up perfectly with the times Velma and Steven received those blocked calls. And the final nail in the coffin was when the DNA results for Latrice's car came back and they found someone's DNA mixed in with Latrice's. And as you can imagine, there was only one African-American man 
in all of North Carolina that it could have been from. But amongst all this evidence, the community was still split on Pastor Reeves' guilt. Other ministers and members of his congregation came out in droves in support of him. Even Latrice's parents felt the police had the wrong man. Sherman had been convinced that Darren had murdered his daughter. But when the trial began, Stephen Randolph told a story that had Reeves supporters running for the exit and caught everyone completely off guard. So when Stephen first accepted Reeves' offer to rent out a nice room for cheap, he really felt it was from the kindness of the pastor's heart. But after he moved in and got comfortable, he started to notice Reeves behaving rather oddly. Nosy is how he put it, poking around trying to make small talk with him, which was fine at first until he started to preach about things like the sins of premarital sex, which occurred right after he brought his girlfriend Velma over for the first time, in which they did have sex. For Reeves to choose that topic at that time meant he most likely knew they had sex, basically spying on him, but he didn't want to ruffle any feathers and get kicked out. He was getting his life together and Reeves' nosiness was just something he was willing to endure as opposed to crashing on couches again. Stephen goes on to say that he brought Latrice home once before and she met Pastor Reeves as well as his sister Willie Mae who occupied the second room of the house. Stephen and Latrice hung out in his room but nothing sexual happened that first time. But of course, after Latrice left, there was Reeves poking his head in. Stephen remained cordial and the pastor came in and sat next to him. This time, it was a conversation about coveting thy neighbor's wife of some sort because Pastor Reeves knew that Latrice was married. Stephen told him that nothing happened and for some reason, the conversation steered into a completely inappropriate place. The pastor looked directly at Stephen's face and remarked that he was such a good looking guy and if he's ever thought about being a male escort because he could make a ton of money. And Stephen admitted that being young and broke, he was a bit open to this idea because money was his main issue and being a ladies man anyways, why not get paid? The pastor continues that they should go into business together and they could make a killing. But first, the pastor asks, how big is your package? What size is your junk? Stephen, in his gullibility, stood up, pulled down his pants for the pastor to judge. Reeves felt that this was the moment to reveal his actual intentions. He reaches out and grabs Stephen's penis. Stephen is completely shocked. He quickly jumps back, pulls up his pants and tells the pastor not to do that. Reeves is then extremely apologetic, but then starts to bargain that if he could just put Stephen's main vein in his mouth, that they could work out an arrangement where he wouldn't even have to pay rent. Stephen tries to keep his cool. He really didn't want to go homeless again. So he tells the pastor that this was a misunderstanding. He doesn't do that stuff with men. Reeves apologizes some more and leaves. Stephen figured he got the point, but after this encounter was pretty much when the threatening phone call started, as well as the vandalism. Quite damning enough, but prosecution had found even more witnesses willing to come forward and their stories helped to strengthen Stephen's words even more. Meet LeQuinton. He testifies that while working at a mall, he was befriended by Reeves. Since the man was a minister, he confides in him that he was having issues with his landlord. Reeves said, well, hey, I'll let you stay in my basement for free if you need. LeQuinton jumps at the incredible offer and moves in. On one occasion, while Reeves was away, LeQuinton had his girlfriend over to have sex. She left before the pastor gets home. But that same day, the pastor bangs on his door, looking upset. He asks LeQuinton, did you have a visitor over while I was gone? LeQuinton lies and says he didn't. Reeves then asks, then why is there a used condom in the garbage? 
Of course, he had to confess at that point, but the matter was dropped. Although, after LeQuinton thought about it a bit, he realized that Reeves had had to have gone through the trash, which was tied up in a grocery bag and discarded in the bin. That was very peculiar behavior, but hey, rent was free. Then two days after the incident, Reeves poked his head into the room and asked to chat a bit. They sat down together, and guess what? He gave the same male escort pitch that he had given to Steven. Though, LeQuinton's reaction was a bit more extreme and Reeves kicked him out. But the story doesn't end there. The vindictiveness of Robert Reeves was about to be highlighted for the jury to see. LeQuinton goes to work the following day and was arrested at his job because Reeves had called the police and charged him with destruction of property, which all it did was waste LeQuinton's time because Reeves had no real basis to this claim and the case was dropped. The next man to take the stand was John, and interestingly, he was the guy that installed the alarm system. So at 8 a.m. the day of installation, he arrives to be greeted by Robert Reeves, fully dressed like he was ready for church. As John starts his work, he noticed that Reeves came back in a tank top and dare I say, booty shorts. And do you need to guess what Reeves chose to tell John? The male escort service, because John had some profitable features. John politely declines, but what happens next will probably traumatize him for the rest of his life. Reeves grabs this man's wrist and forcibly starts yanking on John to come with him. The pastor dragged a grown ass man kicking and screaming into his bathroom where the pastor gets down on his knees and says something to the effect of just let me do what i gotta do i'll pay you whatever you want just let me suck it he even told john to close his eyes that it will feel the same as if a woman did it john broke free and ran out of the property leaving everything all his equipment all the paperwork behind didn't pursue any legal actions after either just happy to be out of that situation. The prosecution then paints for the jury what happened the night after Latrice left Stephen's room. Pastor Robert Reeves saw that his talk with Stephen didn't do much to stop his behavior. He confronts Stephen after seeing Latrice leave and asks him point blank if he just had sex with a married woman. Stephen, getting really tired of Reeves' interventions, told it to him straight, yes I did, and left for Velma's house. How could Stephen know that ever since Robert Reeves laid eyes on him at the car wash, there was an attraction and that watching all these women getting to be with Stephen the way the pastor wanted to be with Stephen turned that attraction into an obsession. Latrice Curtis just happened to be the one that turned it fatal, and given that she was committing a sin herself, he justified taking his own sexual frustrations out on her. Knowing which way she was heading, Reeves climbed into his minivan and sped to catch her. He somehow caught her attention. Seeing that it was Pastor Reeves, Latrice felt safe enough to pull over. Reeves got out of his van, clutching a knife when she opened her door to see what Reeves wanted. He immediately began stabbing her. She tried to run from him, but he was there every step of the way, stabbing until she fell. He turned her onto her back and continued his onslaught. 40 stabs, nearly severing her head. Well, the jury had heard enough. They gave him life in prison without the possibility of parole. <laughs> Alright, come on up, come on over here. You get, you get yourself together. Because this man is a predator. This man, why he's been here this long without, I, I have no idea. I, I, I mean, in just the, the last part. She was a daughter, she was a sister. I mean, she was somebody's niece, I mean, but most of all, I mean, she was, 
She was my wife, she was my future. Dozens gathered in the town of Newport where Latrice Curtis's husband, Darren, grew up. It was Darren who called police to say his wife never returned home from class. The morning onlookers discovered her body on I-5. So, the issue I have with Robert Reeves going to prison is this. Now he gets to go down on as many men as he wants. The penal system for a man like Reeves is more like the penal system. I looked up if North Carolina had the death penalty, and it does. Over 1,000 people have been put on death row since it was implemented. So I can't really imagine who would be more deserving than a rapist, pedophile, murderer that used God's name in vain so he could suck a few dicks. My name is Killian. Subscribe to catch our next video. Leave a comment below and I'll be sure to respond. Until then, protect the people that you love and show love to the people that protect you.